I think in a way libraries are more important than they've ever been. Uh, for one thing, there's so much information out there and a lot of it is no good, but it's very hard to know what is good and what is not. And I feel like that's always been the domain of the librarian, to lead someone to material that will be useful and not full of errors. And as we all know, you know, online research is just fraught with errors. I have definitely used the New York Public Library in my research. In fact, I used to actually work there um, when I lived in a small apartment um, in Manhattan where there was renovation happening underneath us. It was a nightmare, and I started going to the reading rooms even before they were renovated, when they were already spectacular, although I have to say now they're just to me, almost distractingly beautiful. I think, how can you work here? How uh, Am I really allowed to work here? I really have that thought sometimes in that library. I can't believe that an average citizen can just walk in, sit down, and, and do her work there. It's, it's such a thrill. I think it couldn't be more basic and more important that uh, there should be this conduit of knowledge um, and, and thought um, that should be extended to everyone. Uh, it's the only true emancipator. I've always strongly suspected and had it confirmed by experience that there is a, a huge amount of uh, thwarted intelligence that it, it, in the, you know, the less fortunate sectors of society that is never brought out, encouraged, developed. And um, I think it must be tremendously poisonous for society to have intelligence that isn't developed. It begins in adolescence, I think. These are the years when everyone's a writer. Everyone's a nascent writer, in that they are talking to this other voice that seems sort of on a higher level than they are, an internal educator. And this is when you write poems and keep diaries and notebooks and so on. And it's my theory that the writers are the ones who never grow out of that, that they're always happiest when communing with themselves. I went down to Falls Church, Virginia to give a talk about the book early on, and I went into this audience of mainly older white Virginians, um, the kinds of people that others might stereotype. Well, I felt sort of like I was going in the lion's den, but it turned out to be really wonderful. People came up to me and told me about their family stories, because Southerners know these kinds of things happen. It's not the kind of thing that I think many white families talk about, but they know that they had cousins and people who are on the other side of the track, other sides of the racial lines. Archivists have been wonderful to me because they're people who, um, if you're working on obscure topics, sometimes you come to them and you ask a question. They've been waiting for a long time for people to want to use the materials they have. And in my books, I always you know, take care to thank them because I find so many things that, or have given so many things that I would never have found on my own. You do usually, in public libraries, you do naughty things. You steal books, you sometimes open the bottle of beer behind, you know, the, the bookshelves. You look at the uh, proper students and scholars with certain kind of slight disgust, you know, just uh, what the hell are they doing? You know, occasionally I pick up, you know, book of uh, Roth uh, or uh, uh, you know, people who left us, or Meller, you know, or Capote, you know, and, uh, and uh, I feel that I'm part of American culture. And then, uh, then I open Ivan Bunin or Chekhov or Turgenev for a little story by uh, uh, Tolstoy, and I am there. Arts, it's the most humane, and most challenging and most beautiful 
preoccupation of human being. I mean, what else is there? I remember always that dialogue between Joseph Brodsky and Václav Havel. I think it was in New Yorker. I don't remember it. It was a observation of Joseph when uh, he said, Mr. President, don't you think it would be nice in the future instead of when people running, you know, for presidents, let's you know, in different parties, like now Romney and Obama, let's say, if instead of examining them on, uh, on, on political science, math, in terms of budget, this, that, etc., foreign affairs, we would just talk about Dostoevsky, Zola, you know, great philosophers of what they've read, and then we really will decide uh, who's, you know, our life and ch uh, lives of our children than we are uh, giving to. I stand before you filled with deep pride and joy. You have shown such a calm, patient determination to reclaim this country as your own, free at last. When we first met and talked about long walk to freedom, he thought the process would be over in a few weeks. And I said to him in our first meeting, after he said that to me, I said, Mr. Mandela, you must be crazy. And this was the first meeting I ever had with him, at which point his assistant walked in and pulled me out of the room, and I thought the whole project was over right there. I next saw him a few days later, and I apologized for being so brusque with him. I don't know why I used that word. And he sat back in his chair and he said, if you thought you were brusque with me yesterday, you must be a very gentle young man indeed. So nothing that was going to happen between us would ever rival anything that he had been through already. He grew up under what was not only a racist regime, but an authoritarian regime that distrusted the free flow of information. Everything was looked at through the lens of the government of is this going to enlighten the people or keep them in the dark? And of course, the decision was always to keep them in the dark. So books, manuscripts, particularly when Mandela was underground, were incredibly prized and valuable and passed hand to hand. When he was in prison, what he really sought from people and asked for people to bring were books. And he talks about how, for example, he once requested War and Peace by Tolstoy. And of course, the prison censor says, Mandela, how can we give you a book about warfare? They were incredibly ignorant, but he got so much out of that. He finally did get war and peace. So to him, information and knowledge were the lifeblood of democracy.